Okay, that was the world's quickest 30 seconds, so I can get started. Um, so welcome, everybody, We're, uh, in the, for the next talk in our 50th anniversary seminar series. Um, just to remind you where we are, we're almost halfway through today. Um, we'll have a talk with we'll introduce Kirsten in just a second. And then next week, we have another talk from um, Ruby Lung at, at Pacific Northwest Labs about Earth System Modeling for Actionable Science. But today, I'm really happy to be able to introduce uh, Kirsten. Many of you know Kirsten, Kirsten Wagner from JGI. Um, Kirsten is going to tell us today about the JGI Nurse Partnership Lessons in Data Intensive Computing at Scale. So uh, Kirsten first joined NERSC as a bioinformatics computing consultant in 2012, and then it's been um, all great since then. Um, she's the PI of the JGI production um, repo, and I looked at it as best as I could tell within just M342, not even counting the, the special um, the special projects that JGI had running on various their systems. They've run more than seven and a half million jobs. So that's, that's something I'm sure Kirsten will talk about. The other thing I looked up, I looked up um, citations or acknowledgements to both JGI and NERSC, and I found about 150 publications. There's probably much more. But one thing that really caught my eye was that those publications had an average of 100 citations per paper, which I don't know if you look at these things a lot, but but that's a lot. The average nurse paper has about 50, and I Googled around a lot, and it seems like the average um, kind of uh, science in the science paper in, uh, has about seven, and the, there's a claim that half of all papers have zero. So, I mean, 100 citations per paper, it means they're pretty high-impact stuff. And, of course, Sears has been a great partner in super facility and lots of other things. So with that, I'm just going to turn it over to Kirsten. And I guess we'll stand up here to take care of them. It's kind of fun and novel. Actually, when Richard was trying to tell me if there was a room today, it's the only reason I really agreed to do this is because the talk would be ever set. I don't know how many of you are tired of screaming into this boy, but I just like soul crushing a little bit to give talks that way. So I apologize to the people on Zoom as I say that. But uh, yeah, more more reasons to maybe come on site. Uh, yeah. And then, uh, Richard, just a uh, minor correction. I actually started at NERSC in 2010 in the precursor program to NISAP uh, called the Petabyte Scale Postdoc. No, that's they right. They have a cool acronym. And uh, there is one other person who's still on the NERSC staff that was in the program at the same time as me, Brian Austin, who unfortunately couldn't be in the room today to the program Promised. So, uh, just a little marks on history. It all goes down to nurse. Uh, right. So, thanks for uh, the invitation to come in and chat with you all a little bit about this partnership. I think it's gotten maybe a little more interesting to talk about data in 2024, maybe in the last few years, uh, just because he always producing a lot of it need supercomputers to deal with some aspects of it. And that fusion of skills, I think, is kind of interesting. And I'm just going to editorialize here, and hopefully, you know, if anybody feels differently about this, you can argue with me. But I feel like Oscar is full of people who really, really understand large-scale PD. First, the crunch equations. And running those, simulating those, and, like, dealing with the massive output from those. And that's all very challenging and very interesting. And then you've got this field that's just generating tiny point streams of data that come rushing at you. And you don't necessarily need a supercomputer to deal with each individual stream. But you do, it turns out, to deal with analysis and aggregate. Or as those streams start to get bigger, like those coming from light sources, there's really no place else for that data to go. So now we're having to fuse our skill sets of like, all right, I really understand PDs, I understand meshes, whether they be structured or unstructured. I know how to deal with that on a supercomputer too. Now I have to wedge in these workloads that don't look like anything I've really seen before. And I think the partnership with NERSC was one of the first instances where we were really trying to shoehorn this like high throughput workload into a supercomputer and process as much as possible, as rapidly as possible. And boy, did we ever break things routinely. Like, 
I don't know, Shane can tell you, he's been here. Like, we used to break the file system. Jan was one of the consultants, too. Enjoyed breaking things. Nick has worked with us more recently, and we're still breaking things. One of the first things that I broke was Globus, actually. I was being really lazy about a file transfer because we were trying to shut down a file system. And I just wanted to move all the data from that old file system to a new one. I didn't really pay attention to what was in those directories. I just started and just hit the go button in the Globus GUI. And then I got an email from Globus like, what are you, what, what are you doing? This is a terrible idea. Like file names were too long, HPSS was breaking. And so there's a lot you can learn from dealing with different types of scale, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so I think that both uh, organizations have learned a ton uh, working with one another over the past infinity. But I thought maybe it would be useful to tell you a little bit about JGI. I don't know. Do you guys know what JGI is? Nick and Shane and Jan don't get to answer that question. But you know, Eric, familiar? I mean, and Helen knows too. Yeah, we have a lot of like inside information. I can't see the people that are on live. But JGI came out of the Human Genome Project. The DOE, Department of Energy, invested in the Human Genome Project. That seems weird when you say it out loud, right? Like, what were we doing and why would we do that? But it turns out that all the energy that we produced also produced a lot of radiation. And understanding the impact of radiation on the genome was something that was considered a viable research area for the Office of Science. And so there were some really forward-looking folks in the Office of Biological and Environmental Research, it might have had a different name at that point in time, who said, hey, we need to get involved in this. We need to figure out how to sequence the human genome. Lots of folks were working on this, but AGI was formed and actually, I think, completed at least three, yeah, three of the chromosomes you can see there, five, 16, and 19. We had well, very different beats at that point in time. They actually ran that facility 24 seven with people in the labs. And there's some folks over at JGI that were here in that time. I can tell you what it was like, crazy parties, you know, and uh, just lots and lots of dealing with sequence data. And then things started to shift and change where, okay, the human genome is done, yay, what do we do next? How about we look at some weird stuff, some non-human genomes? And so started, I actually cannot tell you what the fish is or what the other sea creature is, but we did some animals. By way, I mean JGI. And it was a production sequencing facility. And they're like, well, let's do some other like hard organisms and try to look at those genomes. And then there was a transition into looking at microbes. And then DOE realized that there was a huge demand from the scientific community to actually produce sequence data for organisms of interest. And so that kind of led to this transition from a production sequencing facility into a user facility where it's like, hey, let's talk to the community. Let's find out what they want to sequence, what's interesting, what could be useful and relevant to DOE mission science. And that's how we got the formation of a plant program. Does anyone here guess why we might be interested in plants? Oh. Because plants are inherently fascinating and important. But that, yes, uh, yes. Fuel. Fuel, yes. How many people here know about the bioenergy research centers, J-Bay? We've got one at Berkeley Lab. They do some cool and weird stuff. How many people here have heard of CRISPR? Why do we care about CRISPR? Cool acronym, what? So erase us. <laughs> <laughs> but also probably accurate. Yeah, so uh, there's this interest in, in biofuels, right? And alternatives to fossil fuel-based products. And now there's this whole concept of a bioeconomy, which kind of gets to the forward-looking nature of JGI. But at the time it's like, all right, let's understand how plants do what they do. And if you think about it for a second, Plants don't really move. They have to respond to their environments, all while being rooted in place, which is weird and cool and awesome. So next time you're walking in a forest, think about that. Like, what would you do if you had all these things that could potentially be eating you and attacking you and you couldn't run away? So I think that's fun. But uh, also plants have these really cool brick areas full of lots of fungi and microbes, keeping them healthy and doing chemical transport. 
And so microbes are of interest for kind of similar reasons, understanding the health of the planet, the health of our environment. Thinking about things like carbon sequestration or nutrient cycling, microbes are really involved in all of that. And then fungi, weird little suckers, right? People like you're going to the forest. Anyway, next time, try to look for fungi everywhere. You can't even see them. And I know there are all these really cool like documentaries about fungi lately, and all of us, babe, that might happen. We are going to have zombies. <laughs> it would be a fungal infection in our brains similar to what happens when it's like in your cut. But uh, so one of the cool things I learned while working at JGI was actually at a JGI user meetup. There's an annual meeting. We get people together and this guy came in and was doing a talk and it was amazing because he had hand drawn all of his illustrations that he used for slides, which one, that's so fun. And I wish that I had the ability to do that. And two, he started talking about the dinosaurs. Why would we be talking about the dinosaurs? Because there are all these different theories about how and why the dinosaurs went extinct. And what do we know about reptiles? How are they different from us? I mean, lots of reasons or ways, but cold-blooded, right. So cold-blooded creatures require way less energy than we do to survive. Like, they're not running, they would not cause a climate crisis. And they just wouldn't really need to, they would just be hanging out, occasionally eating grass and one another, getting really big. So they had already dominated the planet, and they got little mammals coming along, and we need a lot to survive, and there's no reason we should have been able to outcompete that kind of the hypothesis. Until you get an asteroid hitting the Earth, and then suddenly, fungi emerge. And the temperature at which fungi like to live, <laughs> thoughts or fun guesses about that one, it's one you all know very well. They like to b live below 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit. What? That's so weird. I mean, okay, I, maybe this is just me, but this was one of the most interesting things, because I don't know if it's true. There's this idea that like the fungi could not emerge after the asteroid, infect the reptiles, infect the dinosaurs. And so, you know, they take over and no longer, you know, can the, the reptiles live. And then humans are able to kind of emerge or mammals. Really weird and very interesting and something that people like to try and understand. Because one of the things that's happening also is as our climate gets warmer, we are adapting to that warmer climate. And they might be able to gain for colds in, in our 98.6 degree temperatures. So moving forward, it's something that like you want to understand for health reasons. But one of the reasons it gets you know studied within JGI is because those suckers are also really good at breaking down lignin and plants which is something that actually prevents plants from being scalable as biofuels. So that was one of the first reasons to start investigating them. And then it just turns out they're very interesting. And the same thing with algae, algae, very interesting. And those genomes are very hard to sequence. There aren't very many facilities in the world that are taking on these organisms because frankly, like it's kind of annoying to sequence them. And so we have to work with partners at universities that extract the RNA and extract the DNA in enough quantities so that we can sequence them and understand the data. And then the other weird and cool environment would be metagenomics. And we'll come back to that a little bit later, but that means you go out and you collect a sample from any sort of environment and you want to understand what's in it. Example would be your gut microbiome, right? Well, okay, favorite question. Maybe you got some curvy asked before, but how many pounds of bacteria are in your body? 20%. 50 pounds. Come on, units, man. Two. Well, that's it. Two. We got 20. I'm going to tell you it's somewhere in between. Five. Uh, Around five for an average person. Five pounds of bacteria. Sit with that for a minute. You're an ecosystem. That is weird. You have little creatures that are keeping you healthy or not. You know, and like that to me has been one of the more powerful aspects of starting to understand some of what the really capable scientists are studying about the environment. And it all does eventually come back to us. But if you kind of check the human centric nature that we tend to adopt, it's really all the stuff that you can't see that is driving your health, the health of the planet, and then also might be the key to actually combating things like climate change or stopping the use of fossil fuels provided we have policy is a place to deal with that, but that is not something I will talk about. Anyway, so we are a user facility. 
Uh, like Richard was saying, there are lots of publications that come out as a result of uh, the work that JPI does. And I think, I don't know, I can hypothesize about why citations are high. Um, that's actually something that we're looking into. Like, what does a citation mean? That is something we can discuss later. But it's, I think, really interesting if you stop and actually take a moment and start thinking about our impacts as user facilities. And that's one thing that JGI and NARS have in common. Like, I think. You know, think about the impact of, hey, somebody ran an analysis that was scientifically meaningful. They used 90% of Pearl Letter to do that. There was no other resource or very few other resources where they could have done that work. I mean, that's a pretty cool narrative for explaining the value of this facility. We've spent time looking harder at the data that JGI produces and trying to understand, well, why does that matter? And I think you know, going back to that history being one of the first organizations to start looking at microbial genomes in particular. Those are everywhere. They're present in a lot of metagenomes. Also being one of the first organizations to look at metagenomes and try to understand how those are working in the environment. That just leads to a lot of really impactful and interesting data that people reuse. So then when they reuse it, they cite it. And that's, I don't know, it's just kind of an interesting space to think about especially the number of publications and citations just blows up. It is reasonable. And if you're, how many papers should you put out? We have like an exponentially increasing number of scientists and an exponentially increasing number of papers and an exponentially increasing number of data sets. Like how do you like turn a path through that to really understand what's impactful or most impactful? And how do we spend our time doing more of that? And I am off topic, but I just can't help it. Okay, so JGI also by the numbers. So we get about $90 million a year at this point after we move to the Hill. Um, so I don't know how many of you have been over to our really great building. It's in the middle of campus on top of the old Bevatron site where there is, you know, or was radioactive material. But we didn't have any radioactive frogs. They learned this last week. Apparently, uh, Oak Ridge did. They had radioactive frogs and radioactive bud and radioactive trees that had to be cut down. So, I mean, just having a little radiation that then got covered by parking lots and buildings is probably, probably doing all right. The lab's out. Um, <laughs> lots of publications last year in users. So one of the things that uh, I know I heard last week that nurse's user base has climbed like 10,000. It was not that big when I worked here. I remember thinking that 6,000 seemed like a lot and it's just weird. And so we have about 2,300 of those primary users. And kind of what I like to keep in mind when I'm thinking about them is this little picture right here. Primary users are sending us something physical. Like here's a, a soil sample, here's some RNA, here's some DNA, please do something with that and create data, like digital data from that. So that's what happens to those samples. And then that data becomes available to not just the people who gave us the physical object, but also all this large secondary data user community. And that happens through all of our different portals. If you guys ever come up with a different and better name for portal, please send it by way. I don't know why it's fine, I guess, but it's just, it's weird. It's weird that that became the term for everything. It's more editorializing. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is just more information about that and also how uh, we're thinking about outcomes from these different user communities. The secondary use of JGI's data is something that we haven't typically tried very hard to track or understand, but we are now. And yeah, it's pretty interesting. What data are people downloading? And as somebody who's responsible for JGI's data and computing infrastructure, you can see the requests coming in where people ask for hundreds of thousands of files. And then you want to turn around and ask them, what are you doing? Because if I ever downloaded that many files to my laptop or to a local resource, I would have no idea what to do, right? And part of it is that it's very hard for folks to figure out to still the set of information they're interested in, and we'll come back to that. But you know, why are you asking for all of this information? What are you looking for? What are you trying to do? It's become kind of a new scheme of how we work with our user community. And so this is the brief history that Richard really touched on earlier. If I felt obligated to, uh, to share 
how did we wind up here? Because there are some of us in this room that just maybe still wouldn't be here if it hadn't been for the fact that some sprinklers went off in Walnut Creek's data center in roughly 2010. Um, so the day I computing footprint was growing exponentially, and that's probably something I should have touched on in the history. Like suddenly you've got, you know, you go from lots of kind of manual intensive sequencing work, primer walking and stuff, and writing down all those bases to being able to generate tons and tons and tons of short reads, just tons of data that all needed to be stored and computed somewhere. So that growth was happening and Walnut Creek had a very tiny little data center. And uh, they, you know, kind of were trying to meet these demands by just adding more storage, adding more compute. Shane probably got to see some of the original guts of that center. Uh, and it just got too hot. I don't know if you've ever been on the other side of the hills, but it's way hotter over there too. And so, you know, all of these systems running together in a room that was too small eventually led to the sprinklers going off and the hardware going to put. And it turned out that there was hardware that had been purchased as part of the American Reinvestment and Recovery Act. It was on its way here to Walnut Creek that had an accident. And so then they had to get new hardware. So that hardware was destroyed. And then by that point in time, that hardware got redirected to come to the NERSC Oakland facility instead. So at this moment where the sprinklers go off and everything is kind of scary, it's like, hey, we've got this amazing computing resource in the form of NERSC at Berkeley Lab. Why don't we join forces and try to understand and help GGI scale its computing data? And so yeah, this is how it all happened. We created the gene pool system at NERSC, which was a consolidation of a bunch of small clusters that existed across all the JGI groups. So you can imagine plant had its own cluster, fungal, micro, metagenome, and suddenly everything's consolidated. Just imagine if you had to give up your laptop and suddenly everybody worked on what? More, maybe less than thrilled about that, but eventually it gave everyone the scale of computing that they needed. And then in 2012, that was when I joined this partnership and how you here know Doug Jacobson. <laughs> His origins are with JGI, guys. We were bioinformatics computing consultants together. We had really funny, like, Twitter bots that would complain when the system was getting hurt and stuff. And it was a really good time. We would go out to Walnut Creek and problem solve. And then I think in roughly 2013, I was trying to figure out, remember when everything became mental. Because that was an interesting point in time where like the hardware became shared with one of the other, you know, data intensive communities in high energy physics. They were reliant on PDSF. And then uh, in 2019, Mental retired. And at that point in time, GGI had its own cabinet of Corey. And we were weird. We get to have our own cabinet. No one else had their own cabinet. That was just because we had like interesting bespoke scheduling requirements. And we had our own storage still at JGI, and we had to like be able to connect to that. And we wanted that storage to be read only because that was more performant for our jobs. And if that's the kind of stuff you guys are interested in, those kinds of lessons learned, I'm happy to answer questions, but I was too lazy to write and talk about it. So uh, yeah, and then in 2023, before I retired, JGI has its own little mini cluster over at Lab IT, and we are still using the heck out of Pearl Butter. So this is what our infrastructure spectrum looks like now. We do, and actually really that little wedge with the cloud should be a lot tinier, but digitally this is better balance. But anyway, so we really only use the cloud for very small amounts of data and computing. It is incredibly expensive to do any sort of persistent storage there, but we've got the ability to surge if we need to. One thing this slide is lacking is a very cool Dory logo for our Linux cluster that sits at Lab IT, but that's in that middle layer where we've got folks who have like kind of medium amounts of data and computing that they need. And then for larger scale computing, this is really annotation. That's where we're using NERSC. And so what annotation is, you're taking a sample, you're sequencing it, that gives you a bunch of strings. If I gave you a bunch of A, C, T, and G, you'd probably look at it and go, that is cool. I don't know what that means, right? So this is like the genetic blueprint for life still doesn't tell you what was on or off in that organism. It's just kind of like, this is your base sequence. You have to get things like the transcriptome on top of that, which is why people sequence RNA. 
And then why we also do some aspects to understand any chemicals that might be produced. So that gives you an idea of like what the metabolism looks like. So when you're hearing people talk about multi-omics data, it's an effort to think about all of the layers of information that you might have that kind of map back to this central dogma of biology that tells you how your genetic blueprint is connected to the eventual like proteins that might be produced in your body that do interesting things and keep you alive. So all that annotation means is that they're taking that sequence, those sets of strings, I don't know, analyzing them somehow. There's some lookups in some different databases that give people an idea of what those strings actually do, what those genes might be, or what, what strings might be genes, and then what those genes might do, what function they might have. This is still one of the biggest challenges in biology, to actually go from genes to function and reliably. How many people here heard about Alcafold? That's what? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So it's this big, splashy thing. AI bots taking over the world. AI can now solve biology because it can put some predictions of protein structures out there. So then one of the things that people like to do is say, okay, I want to predict like from this gene, I've got this potential protein. And then the structure of that protein really matters for what it does in the body or what it does in an organism. And so understanding that, how it might fold, very useful, very computationally intensive. Loads of nurse scours have been used just for that problem to try and predict what a structure looks like. And then lots of folks have actually done experiments on beam lines to actually capture what those structures look like. They're that important. This goes into most drug di discovery that we work on in human society. Um, so it's very, very useful and important and uses a lot of computing. Great note. Great. Somebody needs to just stop me when you're not listening to me editorialize. So I can talk about one slide in the hours. That's fine. So uh, one of the ways we've, we've dealt with the fact that we've got this distributed computing footprint is to come up with something called JAWS, which I think Danny gave a talk here recently about this system. We've been working with Nick Tyler on this for a while. And so uh, it's just an abstraction that provides for our users just one interface to all of these systems. And then sitting behind that is figuring out how to get all those jobs to run. It sounds really easy, doesn't it? You guys ever tried to run jobs here? Uh, Oak Ridge, Argonne, why do you throw, you know, Emsil in the mix? It is just a non-trivial exercise to get workflows up and running in all these facilities. I think that's one of the motivating drivers behind you know, the project Debbie's leading with IRI, integrated research infrastructure, and I think it'll be really awesome to make that easier for folks like us. Yes, we'll use resources wherever we can get them. So these are just, this is just a note about the technologies that we use. Um, and then I wanted to say something about JAMO, which is JGN's Archive of Metadata Organizer. This data management system came into being in 2013 while JGI was working really closely with NERS. And I was joking earlier about this, like breaking things with Lobus because of this file system migration. That was part of this whole process of realizing that JDI really needed data management in some form or other because the plan was to just put hard-coded links to the file system into the web portal that would be serving this data to the users. And that one person would always have to go in and update and edit the web server and the links and everything so that the data was available. It sounded incredibly painful to me. Not only that, there are these old file systems that were connected by symlinks, and the symlinks, some of them would eventually lead to nowhere. And so we had to traverse this whole file system, figure out what data was there. It was a huge effort amongst JGI and NERSC staff. And at the same time we were doing that, we built this data management system that could keep track of not just the files and the file locations, but a, a pool of metadata describing those files. So then on top of that, you can put a bunch of search and you can centralize that search. And now we have a system that also lets us distribute that data between NERSC and Lab IT. And then through Globus, we're also distributing to Epsilon, we're distributing to Oak Ridge. And then we're modifying this system so that eventually when you're using the system at Oak Ridge, you can do JAMO calls and figure out like what data you might want to find. And so this has been incredibly helpful. I cannot emphasize enough how much having data management 101 under control for a user facility makes a huge difference. Uh, yeah, so this is just a diagram showing the things that we're doing with JAWS. 
we run our containers anywhere and everywhere we can get time um, and on our own systems. And then I was going to note the data portal. So this was a painful process because it actually involved unifying queries across plants, fungi, microbes, metagenomes, synthetic biology, and like people think about their data really differently. But now we have a much more modern data portal and API where people can access the data and that has also been hugely valuable. And it's backed by JAMA. I have all these like weird stories about how JTA data got used so I can just set you guys. But this is, this is one thing to think about when you're thinking about impacts. When you're a facility that's generating a data set, you do something back in 2005 and then it has impacts in 2011. It is really hard to predict how something you do now that sort of creates or like created to generate an answer to one person's question might benefit somebody else. And so, and yeah, okay, a fungal genome that eventually got used by BP, right? And like, you need to have the sequence to be able to do that. So I think that's another reason somebody said you should have it of JGA data. And then this one's fun because you sequence this bacteria and this is my favorite bacteria. It secretes magnets. You don't do that. <laughs> I don't do that. There are no humans or animals that really do anything that cool. But we've got all kinds of microbes that do cool and weird stuff. And then researchers take a look at that, you know, a decade later, and they say, hey, this could actually be really useful for targeting tumors. So that takes some crazy innovative, and you know, humans to kind of synthesize and put that together. But real bearded pull. Uh, this is about fake meat. Fun, right? Eventually we could have that. Uh, and then, if you ever want to terraform marks, we need oxygen. Yeah, they didn't think those words would come up in today's talk, but they didn't. Yeah, that happened. So these sequences of these bacteria lead to thinking about things like bioengineering, the bioeconomy, which is incredibly valuable. Uh, if you want to listen to a cool podcast, I'm just going to throw this out there. I know there's a proliferation of podcasts, and I just want to say, Manica does an amazing job. It is not boring. It's really fun to listen to. And this one I threw up here because it's not super convenient, but really, I think all the other ones are better. And uh, I mean, I shouldn't say that, but like, you know, like from a subject matter perspective, it's like you can learn things, everything from like how DGI actually functions as a facility, but then you can learn weird fun facts about budgie. And I listen to these while I ride my bike. It's, it's just pretty fun. Yeah. But this was a connection between computing and biology, probably more of what people thought I was going to say. So go learn about it there. Oh no, there's a video playing. I didn't anticipate that. Oh no. Okay. Uh, so future work that we have things that are going on with us, so looking at like um, how we can build bridges between JGI and the other BER facilities. Um, something I was alluding to is thinking about like the data citations that we have in our systems and how to connect those together. And we have a system for doing that because we really want to understand data users. Um, and there's a big push within BER to think about like, how do we unify all the data? Not asking why do you want to unify all the data? But uh, there's a lot that we can do with the how before really understanding and maybe helping people like think about the why. Why might you want to combine fungal genetic blueprints with microbial genetic blueprints. And it turns out because we're all made of the same chemical substances. And maybe by having all those things in one combined huge tree, you can think about the genes and functions that are shared between organisms. I have no idea. I'm not a biologist. That's this talk is probably fairly elucidated. So um, I'm going to stop. And then it's our questions. And so don't worry, please chat. Thanks to all the people online, sir. Somebody answer your question. Yeah. Some people it was so good. Well, so thanks. 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 Thanks, Kirsten. I think uh, I, my video has been disabled, but you can hear me, I hope. Yes. I was really interested. If, if, if there are more questions, if there's any questions, it looks like there's one in the Q&A. Can you talk a little bit how you leverage AWS? Yeah, we spent uh, very specific workflows to AWS. They're, I think, very 
two that are set up for it. Um, and and there, there could be others. I think there, there's one in the play program where they're doing an experiment that's not necessarily in production yet. There's one for metagenome assembly. Um, my God, who moved into the cloud just because we had a huge backlog of uh, metagenomes. Metagenomes are an object that require a lot of memory to be able to assemble and analyze them. And that was actually the heart of the MetaHipper project is figuring out how to run and analyze metagenomes without a huge memory footprint by distributing across a bunch of nodes. And so that was one application for the cloud that made sense because we had only, you know, 20 or so large memory nodes that are disposal. Great. Thanks. Let's see. Boston. Boston. Brian Austin. You accumulated and curated a great deal of data. What are your plans for using AI to analyze that data? Try it. Nice. Come on. All right. So uh, I'm trying to think of a non way to respond to this. And uh, I, I actually think biological data is one of the places where AI could have the biggest impact because there's so much of it. So much of it is driven by observation. And unlike a lot of the other fields like that are funded by the Department of Energy Office of Science, we don't have a lot of mathematical underpinnings that connect one experiment to another. So you might have data generated on a sequencer and it's connected because it's all DNA. But that's, that's kind of where that stops in a way. It's, you know, the chemistry is the same, but you don't know how those organisms are related. You don't necessarily know how the genes in one organism like are related or, you know, on in one place, but not in another without actually doing these huge systematic surveys to collect all of that information and then reason about what potential patterns you might see. And I think that's a place where AI can potentially help us just because there was an article a few years ago, it was like big data, astronomical or biological. And the amount of information that we need to collect and synthesize just to understand what patterns might exist in biology is beyond anything that we can really imagine right now. To represent the genome of every microbe is a yacht of metadata. And that's just looking at diffs, right? Like not even having like the whole sequence itself. And going through that, understanding it, and then layering on top of it all the other omics data and other measurements that you might take. It's just, I don't know how we're going to do that, to be blunt. But then to be able to use AI, the reason I find it a little painful is like, there aren't that many facilities like JGI that are generating these data sets at scale consistently with consistent sets of metadata. And we do a good job with that, but we still need to do a lot better in order for the data to be useful to even more people that have already been using it. So when you get a sequence, it's a, you know, string, and it might tell you that that's a particular microbe, and maybe it's the one that secretes magnets, but you need, in order to form a hypothesis, you don't just need to know that that's the microbe that you've got, you wanna understand where it came from. You wanna understand what else it was interacting with. You wanna understand the time of day that, this, that the sample was taken. You wanna understand, like, I don't know, what's going on with the climate at that location. And so there's all this auxiliary information, contextual information that's needed before you can actually ask a question and get an informed response from a computer. Otherwise, you just need humans to think about it. And so there's going to be a huge effort when we're talking about data integration that actually goes through and kind of curate and align our descriptions. Because uh, if I were to hold up some dirt, of course, the scientists like to say that it's soil. Not dirt, but it's dirt, you know. They, the, everyone in this room would describe it differently. And you would all come up with different questions potentially to ask about that sim single sample. And so even when you have an ontology to describe it, there's still all of the ways people analyzed it that was driven by like how they describe it, how they think about it. So you also always need to capture that line of reasoning with how the experiment was set up. So we've got this proliferation of data, very few organizations like GGI, and that makes it very hard for the data to actually be integrable. And if you can't integrate it yourselves, there's no hope that a computer is going to integrate it for you. 
I mean, it could the same way I could if I just wanted to say, okay, it's integrated smash, right? Like we'll just concatenate all this stuff. That's not scientifically meaningful. So I think at the end of the day, if we want scientifically meaningful artificial intelligence, we have a solid decade worth of work to do to clean up our data, get it into structures where our AI can help us help ourselves. And then potentially we would have self-driving labs in the future that could collect even more data in a standardized way. So I guess it all gets back to standardization and judgment calls. We're just, we're not there yet, but it would be amazing if we could get there. Okay, Kirsten, we'll bother you for one more question and then and then wrap it up. Did you see Nick's um, question on chat? Any questions? Uh, come on, Nick, I swear you were there when this decision was made. Uh, <laughs> so the, the question is, we in HPSS love the JGI JAMA solution. Uh, but was there a reason for developing an in-house solution versus an off-the-shelf product? <laughs> so um, so the, the reason for that had to do with ownership of the data at the time and the number of file systems we were operating. And it wasn't just HPSS. We had, uh, it was the precursor to DNA, it's house and whatever project B. And I, like, I can't even remember all the file systems now. Um, but we like the one solution that we considered was iRods. And at the time, I don't even think we could have installed iRods at NERSC because I think it needed to kind of own the whole file system it was operating on, which would mean owning project and project B and any other file systems that JGI had data on, which would mean owning all the data for all the other users too. Not ideal. And so um, JAMA was actually like a fairly lightweight thing. And I don't know that they're, even today, are solutions where you can let users create these templates of metadata that then get enforced by this other little object when the workflows are running. And that's been really valuable for us. Uh, so yeah, otherwise, honestly, we don't want to build stuff in ourselves and maintain it. It's such a pain. And would an S3 HPSS interface enable additional workflow capabilities or otherwise enhance the JGS use of HPSS? Absolutely. And I'll tell you what. Geographic distribution of stuff. If we could refer to all of our files the same way, that actually simplifies our code a lot. Simplifies the way we have to think about it. Another thing we've been talking about is like when you're making an S3 call from one location to another, you're streaming that data. And like for us, we just kind of need to stream it over, process it, and dump something else out. We don't actually need to make many, many copies of the data itself, except that it, that's what's needed right now to process it. And so there would be ways that we could simplify not only like how much data gets stored and kept someplace, but just some way we interact with the systems if that were possible. Thanks for the questions, guys.